The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. I love it. Uh, uh, I've shared this before. I had a youth pastor in my first pastorate who used to be able to come up, prophesy the title of my messages, and I didn't share my messages. Jennifer doesn't even know sometimes uh, really where I'm going and what I'm doing, but now she does because she types them out for me. Uh, I used to scribble them with magic marker and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, I have moved up to, I used to preach off of a back of a paper plate and napkins. I mean, I'm really moving up in the world. Jennifer types them all out and color codes them. She makes it so pretty, I don't want to throw them away. I've got to save them. But in the words that were given today, spontaneously in song, I heard uh, sons and daughters. I heard a family uh, bringing unity to a family that God wants to bring. And basically, that's the title of the message, Reparenting the Church. I'm going to say that again. Today's message is Reparenting the church. And you say, what in the world does that mean? There's a spiritual application of parenting that is an absolute necessity. Our passion is full stature to equip the saints to grow up, to be mature mothers and fathers, to handle a harvest, right? You don't want babies raising babies. We need mature saints, mothers and fathers raising children. And if this harvest is going to be as great, and I believe it is, as many have prophesied, it's going to require every believer to be a discipler. There's no leaders, there's no ministry teams that are large enough nor well-equipped enough to handle a huge harvest. But if we can get the individual believers to deal with self-deliverance, learning how to deal with stuff themselves, they can then disciple some a uh, new believer uh, effectively, teaching them how to go directly to Jesus, returning to the simplicity rather than a method or a formula, returning to the simplicity that's Jesus in you, the hope of glory. Two major revelations. Uh, there are many mysteries in the Bible. Mysteries require revelation to understand. And the two that I feel are the most important is that Jesus is the Word. Jesus is a person. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. We're going to have to get back to the simplicity of Jesus in you as the Word. Not ink on a page. Many have gotten to the point, even to the point of almost worshiping the Word like it's the third person of the Trinity. No, it's, it's the, the Word is the very essence and the nature of Jesus Himself. And they will never contradict one another. Therefore, if you know the Word inside out and backwards, you better learn Jesus inside out and backwards, right? Because Jesus and the Word are one. And there's going to have to be a stronger emphasis on the personhood of that Word. You will do things with an it that you would never do with a person. And therefore, that Word needs to be honored, treasured, and respected. Now, that revelation... When it was dealt with me, it was basically 1 John 1, where, where God basically said, uh, this John was all excited. He says, our eyes have seen him. Our ears heard him. We touched him concerning the word of life. Who is he referring to, the word of life? Jesus. Jesus. He says, we touched him. Our hands have handled Him, our ears have heard Him, and our eyes have seen Him. And guess what? Jesus resurrected, and He's still just as excited. He's still seeing Him, He's still hearing Him, and He's still touching Him. And He says, and I want your joy to be full like mine, and become part of what we're doing. What are we doing? We're fellowshipping with Him. We're seeing Him, we're hearing Him, and we're still touching Him. That resurrection didn't, uh, and ascension into heaven did not inhibit their relationship one bit. 
They were still seeing, hearing, and touching. And I'm saying that's when the Word's made flesh. That's when the Word and Jesus are reality. That's when you're honoring and knowing intimately the person. Until then, you have to read about Him. I don't want to read about Him. I want to, I want, even when I read the Word, I want to meet the author. I want to meet the Holy Spirit's reality when I read that Word. I want to touch the person of God Himself. And, of course, the second revelation, or mystery, uh, Colossians 3.15. The Christ in you, the hope of glory. And until that revelation, those two mysteries have been revealed, it's a, they're a must. Revelation is a must. Until that person is real. Matter of fact, I always like to use Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. Are you picturing this in your head while I'm saying it? The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide asunder between soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You're picturing the Word. You're picturing ink on a page. You're picturing your Bible, aren't you? Guess what? Verse 13 says, All things are naked and open to the eyes of Him. That preceding thing is living. It's active. It's Jesus. It's not just ink on a page. We know that the tendency will be to learn it as ink on a page. This is where you learn about Him. But that Word is alive and active, and it requires revelation and intimacy with God to make it substance, to where you own it, to where you are a partaker of the divine nature or His presence. You want that word written. You want it engrafted. You want it to become so much a part of you that when you preach, you don't just move by your anointing to preach. You move by the substance of the radical change that it did in you. It's not information, transformation. Big difference. So then training can begin. Because if you're not aware of the spirit world and without intimacy with Jesus, your awareness is dull. You still need milk in the daily activities. But strong meat belongs to those who are full age, who by reason of use. By reason of use means relationship, acting upon it. And then you can discern. You cannot discern without a relationship. The soulish man, it's foolishness to him. That could even be a born-again believer who basically is a head person. You can basically say, all oh, this discernment, I don't understand it. Of course not, because it's not soulishly understood. It's spiritually discerned. But the spiritual man discerns all things. So basically, that should be your mandate as a born-again believer, to discern all things. All right, now I'm getting to the message. I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm just warming up. Uh, it's basically the need to reparent the church. And I believe there's a need for understanding the principle of mothering and fathering. Not mothering and fathering uh, to where uh, you're, you're adopting people. Uh, mothering or fathering as far as a spiritual principle. As a matter of fact, it doesn't matter if you're male or female, you can mother and father in the spirit. And understanding primarily fathering Fathering depends on transference. How many have heard the messages on transference of spirit? All right, transference means it moves from a substance that moves from one person and then takes up residence in another. Uh, basically, Paul deposited in Timothy. He didn't just teach Timothy a bunch of information. He basically says, I have no one who is like-minded, who will genuinely, I'm going to send you Timothy because I don't have anybody else like-minded. Uh, He's like a son to me, and I have no one. Everyone seeks their own. Isn't that interesting? Do you know a father to son, what he should teach it if there's a transference, is all of a sudden others and their interests become more important than your own. Parents would rather see their children being all that they could be than, than pertaining to what they're amounting to. I'd rather see my kids play on the swings than play on the swings anymore. Now I'd get nauseous, you know. <laughs> but it's more enjoyable to see them become all that they can be. 
that's full stature. That's a hunger and a desire, but it's an other's orientation that doesn't come without a, a maturation process, without internal transformation. I mean, I've seen people chronologically, even on TV, that quite frankly, to me, they're still a young man or a young woman, regardless of their chronological age, because the entire emphasis is on what they can do. The entire emphasis ought to be on what has been imparted and deposited and seen reproduce reproducers, harvest of harvesters, whatever terminology you want to use. So the importance of fathering depends on a transference of spirits. And it basically molds character, reconstructs motivation, transforms attitudes. I'm going to give you a, a, up front. I wasn't intending on get Jennifer's going, I didn't type these notes. <laughs> This is a spontaneous Sunday, so. Uh, but there are five steps to receiving uh, a mentor or a father spirit in the church. And in order to do that, you can't be ultra sensitive, thin skinned, wounded all the time, interpreting everybody's actions and reactions negatively. You're just walking wounded. Uh, that You have to learn. The basics. What we teach in this church is how to deal with your issues and die to your agendas. Those things will discourage you from maturity. If you have an agenda or if you have issues, issues are like wearing barbed wire. No matter how you relate to people, you poke them. <laughs> and you wonder, why does everybody reject me? Could be that you're rejecting. <laughs> could be you're poking. It could be that it's you. <laughs> What was the old saying, uh, I, Pastor Cliff likes that saying, if someone says, well, my mother doesn't like me, my brother-in-law doesn't like me, my son doesn't like me, my daughter doesn't like me, the people in the church don't like me. Who's at the scene of every crime? <laughs> Perhaps there's an internal adjustment here. And it, maybe it's not all of those people. All right. You like that? Got that from Pastor Cliff. Next time I say it, the Lord gave it to me. I only give credit one time. Okay. All right. But here's some, here's some principles I want to cover. When I say mothering and fathering, it's a principle. Now, it has nothing to do with your gender. You can be male or female. But understand the spiritual application of this, because this is where I believe the church is going to have to go. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 4, 15, everybody's familiar with that verse. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ yet you do not have many fathers. Have you ever pondered on that? Though you have 10,000 10, instructors, you do not have many fathers. And 1 Corinthians 4.15. <clears throat> well, they want to go back to the five steps. Huh? Okay, I'm going to backtrack for those people that take notes. Bless your heart, as they say in the South. All right. The five steps is you can't be ultra sensitive, number one. Number two, you can't be insecure. Three, oh, you'll love this one. Your own vision needs to die. I've had people argue with me on that one. Keep arguing. I can show you every single person in the Bible. By die does not mean cease to exist. Die means you release your demand on it and let God develop it. Die does not mean cease to exist. It simply means die to your self-interest and selfishness about your vision and your dream to such a degree you're in the way. <laughs> God will resurrect it when he's Lord of your life, when you can let it go. If you ha haven't been faithful in what is another man's ministry, what makes you think you're going to be faithful in your own? We don't like that part. That's part of the dying, though. It's actually part of your schooling and your training. How many know about temperaments? The D, the I, the S, and the C. I, I got a kick out of it because Joshua was a D, a DI, and that's a mover and a shaker and a natural leader. And who did he do? He put him under Moses for years as a right-hand man. I'll bet that killed his flesh real good. 
but it made him the kind of leader that he needed to become, a true commander, a true leader. But he had to be under someone like Moses for many, many years. How many years was that? Forty? Forty-some years under Moses. How's that for school? And some are upset after year one when their ministry hasn't taken off yet. God said, I haven't even broken the shell of your flesh yet. All right? The fourth element, you need to avoid the snare of complaining, rebellion, and murmuring against leaders. Because that'll, that'll transfer to your marriages, it'll transfer to all authority figures, your boss at work. If that's in the heart, it has a way of coming up. Release forgiveness to all of them. When I planted my first church, I'm going, God, I don't know how to do this. But I had such a bad mentor, I knew how not to do it. Do you think you could be trained by a bad mentor? At least you can learn what not to do. I did the opposite and God blessed it. David was mentored by Saul. <laughs> not the best quality. And fifth... You need to learn to serve from a place of love and not give in order to get. Live to give and serve. Because if you're ever going to be a leader, you have to be a servant leader. So you might as well learn to serve in the early years. And recognize that there will always be a portion that cannot be mentored. Lot is a good example of someone who couldn't be mentored. Abraham loved Lot, but Lot could not be mentored. There will always be a portion that cannot be mentored. Abraham rescued him, or Abraham loved him, Abraham did everything, but when it comes to strife, you go your way, do what you want to do, because you're going to anyway. And just remembering that, that's your, actually your sixth point. <laughs> Lots can't be mentored. Can't be ultra sensitive. You can't be insecure. You die to your vision. You need to avoid complaining against leaders. You need to serve. And as a little footnote, lots can't be mentored. Remember, there will always be some people that are not teachable. Okay? Now, back to mothering and fathering. All right? It's Monday morning, mom gets the kids out of bed, feeds them a nutritious breakfast, reminds them to gather up their books and homework, and gets them to school on time. That's kind of a mothering example, whether that's done by a man or a woman, isn't it? Gather them together, get them together. The mothering approach provides an atmosphere of love, safety, and security. So ideally, mothering is done in an even-handed way, giving all of the children essentially the same resources, and generally kids love the provisions from their mother. If you, however, take that model and transfer it to the church, you can have enabling, would be the negative side. The positive side is that they will feel safe and secure. For a church to grow as a family, mothering is absolutely essential. You can't father a church that has not been properly mothered. If they don't feel safe and secure, they're not gonna, you're not going to be able to father them. Father them means to pull the gold out, to pull an, the achievement out of them, to pull the nest. But if they don't feel safe and secure, you're not going to get anything out of anybody. So the mothering is the absolute first step. Without mothering... In the first place, the child will not learn. If you're a note taker, write that down. Without proper spiritual mothering, the child will not learn. It takes a mothering approach, whether it's a male or a female, to create an environment of a rested, fed, well-nourished child at school. Are you ready? This is my favorite part. But after mothering, 
Uh oh. After mothering has reached high tide, it still requires fathering, whether by a male or a female, to create the pressure. I might like this too much. To create the pressure to unpack the potential in the child. And you notice the part that I am excited about the most, even with ministry, it's not me doing something to someone. When I minister, I like to teach while I'm ministering and let the Jesus in them, you're unpacking them. Let the Jesus in you rise up and bring health and healing to you. Let the Jesus in you forgive. Let Jesus stand on your own two feet. See, that's the fathering. That's the equipping the saints as opposed to enabling them and being, some people are so needy, they, they have to feel needed. They care more about being needed than they care about the person they're praying for. They've not been properly mothered. They don't feel safe and secure. They're insecure. So they're trying to get security by what they do. But you're skipping an important relational step. You, needed, you need to be in an environment where you're safe and protected. All of my churches, without advertising it, all of my churches, though, for as long as I can remember, the single people felt safe. Is that true? We got some single people here? They felt safe. They felt protected. And that's important. So if a single person in your church feels safe and protected, then the beginning of them really learning and being equipped, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're, the, the learning curve is going to skyrocket compared to sitting in church forever and learning and learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. So our, our emphasis, even in our church, is the 60-day challenge, the peace challenge. Team 101, where we teach you to troubleshoot so that people getting ministry do not fall through the cracks just because you don't know what to do with someone who's giving you a hard time. We love a hard time. That's school. You learn how to navigate because the love of God is shed abroad in your heart and you don't want anybody to fall through the cracks. You don't walk away from somebody. I remember the first time I got reprimanded for that in church. Uh, Universal, we're kind of guilty of this. I was doing altar ministry. And I can discern the human spirit really easy. And I, I'm walking to this person and they're drinking it in and you're ministering and you're letting Jesus, just enjoying it. I move to the next person and it was a brick wall. As a matter of fact, it was even a push of rejection coming. My first thought was, and this is what a lot of people doing ministry do, my first thought was, why did they even come up here? They're clearly not open. There's a brick wall. And I started to go to the next one because, listen to this, the next one was going like this. So, obviously receptive. So, the one with the brick wall, you're going to go. And I started to do that, and God spoke almost in an audible voice. It was that authoritative. He said, don't do that. And I went, whoops. And I went back, and I felt that woman with the rejection and the wall. and the, She's probably thinking, I'm coming up, but I, every time I come up, nothing ever happens anyway. I don't know why I bother coming up. They'll, reject, they'll probably reject me just like everybody else. Okay, so I'm standing in front of her, and the Lord just says, don't move. So I just drop down to my spirit, and I start releasing love. What, what are you going to do? He said, don't move. I'm going to do something redemptive while I'm standing here doing, and I'm releasing love to her. And all of a sudden, I could feel this thing go like this. I don't know how to explain it. And then it went, Poof! and when it dropped, she burst out, God really does love me. She got the breakthrough. The only thing I did was release love to her and not move over. What, would have, what do you suppose a person with a lot of rejection issues and walls and they're kind of afraid of leadership and they kind of don't trust authority and then they're up there and they finally come up there even with all their walls. They come up there and then you go, eh, okay, next. You know what they would hear in their head? There it happened again. Every time I get prayer, somebody rejects me. And what the Lord was showing is, Dennis, your discernment was accurate, but your application was non-redemptive. He wanted me to stay there and be redemptive as opposed to letting her fall through the cracks and just fortify that rejection in her. Isn't that good? So... You can discern accurately, but your action can be unloving and non-redemptive. So it's not about being right. It's about how did you respond 
to the revelation that you got? Was it redemptive or not? Was it loving or not? Okay? So I saw right then what she needed was mothering, really. She needed to feel safe and secure. She needed to feel that God loved her. And isn't it interesting, I'm the one standing in front of her, and she didn't say, oh, Dennis loves me, oh, he accepts me. It was God. That was proper, and that's the way it should be. But after that mothering reaches its high tide, it still requires fathering. Pressure is like a boot camp. Generally, I believe what these people did here, I'm so proud of them coming up like that. That was with one little practice of spontaneity, nothing planned. Matter of fact, they didn't even have copies of the music because the printer down the hall didn't work. And, uh, it was just like when you get out of your comfort zone and just get you and Jesus, the real you comes out. The gold comes to the surface, the divine nature. That's equipping opposed to having it so planned, so safe, and so secure that you don't even need God. Isn't that true? You can have something so planned out, so safe, so secure, you don't even need God because it doesn't require any faith on your part. <laughs> so I'm very proud of them. But generally, children do not like the pressure from the fathering components. Does that make sense? Sure. What kid goes to school and likes to have a quiz or a test, especially if they weren't warned? What do you do? You go, uh... But that's part of growing up, isn't it? It's part of preparation. It teaches you motivation. It teaches you character. It teaches you attitude. It teaches you responsibility. Mothering is a type of the womb. Think about it. Mothering is a type. And I'm, unfortunately, uh, I think too many churches have stayed a womb. A womb is basically an environment that's special. It allows the body to develop passively. Doesn't the baby in the womb develop passively? Hmm. The body did not come to a point of excellence in the womb, though, did it? It couldn't walk. It couldn't sit up. It couldn't run a mile. Couldn't play the piano. Might have wanted to. Didn't know what a piano was yet. Just had a feeling. Jesus mothered his disciples. They were with him day and night. He had endless conversations with them. He encouraged them. He reinsured them. But just like a school teacher designs, uh, dad wants to lead by being a good example and a provider in the home. The fathering approach is to unpack the potential in the child. Mothering has to precede fathering. Fathering has to follow mothering. And the more challenging the fathering environment, the more the person's potential rises to the surface. But you don't want to be mothered or fathered by somebody who's preeminent. In other words, it's all about me and what I can do. Support me because I can do stuff. That's more the young man. And that may be okay to a point, but eventually that independence, that rugged individualism needs to become part of something bigger than himself. I like the challenge that after Jesus mothered them, so to speak, and made them feel safe, secure, built a relationship, a real relationship, one where you could touch them one where he could be heard, one where you could voice your opinion. The interesting thing is, do you remember the time when he equipped them and sent them out on their own? He expected them to draw on what was inside of them, not from him or a safety net. Don't take anything with you. Huh? And send them out. And I'm not going. I'm sending you out, but I'm not going. And there's no safety net. You're going to have to draw from within your potential. If that potential is never tested or given opportunity, it's not going to happen. You have to get out of the nest, little birdie. The old story of the eagle that takes the down out of the nest until those little sticks start poking the, the little backsides of the little eaglets to where it's not comfortable in the nest anymore. Because the mother would hover over the nest and it's literally 
incubate your destiny. This is your destiny to soar. Now I'm going to tip some of you out, to maybe even put you on my wing, drop a few, swoop down and catch you. School. Life is school. <laughs> and it's how you respond to it. It'll either make you bitter or better. All right? Mothering focuses on equality. Fathering focuses on differentiation. How many moms and dads, you have, your children were different? All right? You wanted to love them the same, but basically there was a differentiation when it came to achievement, and the goal that you pulled out of them is going to be not the same with each one. I love looking for the goal in an individual, knowing that they don't have to be like anybody else, and they don't have to be anybody's clone. They're a one of a kind, and their specialness is like a beautiful setting to a diamond ring. Jesus being the diamond, but the settings are so unique. But pull that out of them. And a lot of times they got to die to their agendas and deal with their issues for that setting to really shine forth. There's lies, there's uh, wounds, there's hurts that are basically interfering. But basically, fathering focuses on future potential. I believe that's apostolic. I believe apostolic has a way of not just ministering to your needs, your felt needs. A true fathering apostolic anointing is ministering to your potential and your calling. And then drawing the gold out as opposed to just giving you everybody a peanut butter jelly sandwich and make you feel safe. Right? That's good in the beginning. At some point, you need to go stand on your own two feet. Too much mothering, they focus on immediate caregiving. Pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. Pray for me, pray for me, and clingy, clingy, clingy. Too much mothering, they become dependent on others for provision. Or others need to create the right environment for me to succeed. Oh, really? That's other people's job, to create the right environment for you. Who appointed you general manager of the universe? Huh? <laughs> Other people need to create the right environment for me to succeed. If I don't succeed, it's everybody else's fault. They feel they are special. I love this one because there's a whole generation that were taught this in school, so we've got to blame our educational system. They feel they're special without any particular character development. Well, aren't you just special? What does that breed? Entitlement. Special should be based on achievement. We just, we just read of a study of a professor down in Florida, right? All of a sudden it dawned on him, you know, making all these children and indoctrinating them that they're so special without achievement was wrong. Oops, oops, now we're going to change it. You need to accomplish something in life to feel good about yourself. You need to do something with your life to feel good about yourself. And don't look around for other people to do it for you or make it happen. And that's something. You believe they're automatically entitled because I'm alive. I was born, I'm special, therefore. J. Edgar Hoover in my day, J. Edgar Hoover was before my day, but J. Edgar Hoover in my day basically said the sign of a juvenile delinquent is someone who thinks the society owes him a living. Back then, they called that a juvenile delinquent. Now we call it normal. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a friend of ours. He's a, he's a physician. And when he left uh, Africa, he went to his pastor mentor and he said I'm going to America what church should I go to he said oh son he says as a father to a son don't look for a church look for a father that's a father that loved his son you see we have a concept of learning by instruction. Though you have 10,000 instructors, you don't have many fathers. 
Don't find a church. Find a spiritual father. Maturing requires fathering. Mothering alone is not enough. Um, I could give an extreme example of mothering. Uh, when we traveled, I saw leaders that leaned toward dictators. Anybody ever experienced that? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> and others went the opposite end in the name of I'm not a controller. I'm a releaser. And it sounded really good, but what I found out was their release was bordered on irresponsibility. Anybody that messed up, they had no place to come back to. Like a prodigal, I at least had, you know, even the servants at my house. I might have been ticked off when I left, but at least I know my father had it better. Hmm? They don't know where to come back to. They don't have anybody to come back to because they're so afraid they're going to miss something, they have to be everywhere. Exposure doesn't mature it. Relationship is what brings you into the place of maturity. Receiving uh, uh, information alone is passive. It's mothering. It's data acquisition is like being in the womb. Understand more, but you can't do more. Say that with me. I understand more, but I can't do more. That's a sign that you need fathered. You understand more, but you can't do more. Informed, but not transformed. A changed life. I'm, I'm still blown away by Jennifer's mentor. And she was a good mentor in many ways. But she had a bad, faulty theology. She felt that if you weren't relatively emotionally adjusted when you got saved, you'd only go so far. Isn't that sad? Because that was her church experience. She saw the same people coming to the altar with the same problem year after year after year after year. They all love Jesus, but they're still the same. So she built a theology. If you're not pretty well adjusted, you're only going to go so far. I, on the other hand, as a baby Christian, I only saw changed lives. I had people much more my seniors say, send them to Dennis. Because my, but my exposure was, it wasn't a theological for me to think anybody needed to stay wounded, hurt, or undelivered. And I have not seen it to this day. I've seen people who want to be mothered and don't want to change. They want freedom. But fathering is going to have to fill that gap. Mothers and fathers are going to have to fill that gap of the tyrant dictator authority and the lenient do whatever you want because I don't care anyway. That is not a releaser. That is not a virtue. Thank God they're not a dictator, but at the same time, it's irresponsible because they're going to give an account for those people that were given under their charge. And you can't say, well, I'm, I just don't know. I'm busy. That's not going to work. Transformation. I uh, worked with a surgeon who basically just really inspired me with the way they teach surgeons. We should be teaching the church the same way as a surgeon. See one, do one, teach one. Would that put us in a growth zone or what? You saw someone do it, then it was your turn to do it. Not observe, take notes, do it. Then after you do it, teach someone else. I'm just hoping I don't get that surgeon that I'm the first one. Isn't that what we ask them? If you've ever gotten surgery, you go in and say, how many times have you done this? <laughs> I would, knowing this, I know. He scared me with that one. I'm going, oh boy, I'm going to ask, how many have you done? Knowing who we are is not the same as unpacking who we are. And this is my prayer. This is Jennifer's prayer. Those that are in Kingdom Life Church and those that are related to us outside of uh, this local church and full stature ministries, basically I spend my entire week with people outside of this church unpacking leaders, unpacking people who want to help other people. They're already ministering to other people, but they still need unpacked because believe it or not, there's missionaries who are hurting on the mission field. Believe it or not, there's pastors that are hurting. And those things can be addressed 
and they can benefit multitudes beyond all that I could benefit if I can troubleshoot their issues. Fathering gives you the opportunity and the pressure to unpack who they really are, but it requires doing, not just listening. You have to take it seriously. You've got to apply it. That's why you have the 60-day challenge, the peace challenge, the challenge, challenge, challenge. That's all fathering stuff, no matter whether a man or a woman's teaching it. You listen to the sermon Sunday. There's you streamers. There's Tuesday night. There's modules. Uh, you can learn simple prayer. And what we notice is that some people will, will learn some of our material just to take care of their owies and feel better. There's others that take it because they say, this not only worked for me, but I'm going to help other people. That's what we're really looking for because I think that's the responsibility of every believer, to be a disciple, not just someone who knows stuff. And what good is it if you know stuff and you're not contributing it to anybody else? But make sure you know something and don't just have a need to be ministering to somebody else. Some people want to skip that step. They want to be the doctor before they've been sufficiently the patient. I think every medical doctor, if there's any medical doctors listening, and I know there's a few, uh, should have been the patient. You should feel what it's like to be a patient first, and then you will have even a better bedside manner as a doctor, wouldn't you? Hmm? I have a friend that I, I mentored through uh, medical school. He was an eye surgeon. And what was interesting is he eventually uh, quit doing surgery, and he got a job at Merck uh, Research. And he took his medical expertise and he basically said, what he, as a surgeon, he was seeing more of man's inhumanity to man. People were, got in a bar room brawl and they got glass in their eye and he's plucking it. He said he wanted to, he wanted to minister to, to mankind, but yet he was getting discouraged at seeing man's hostility to man. So many unnecessary surgeries because of people's sinful behavior, really. But eventually he got to the point where he wanted to go to Merck. He developed litmus tests that would replace being probed and poked. And that was, he felt fulfilled in the Lord knowing that he's making it easier for someone else. That someone else does not, as a patient, have to be poked and probed and have tubes stuck here and there. That he could develop litmus tests to ease their pain. I said, that that really intrigued me because I saw him. That needed to be unpacked in him, though. I had to pray him through the discouragement of when he was going through medical school. I had to pray him through the issues and the agendas and the bedside manner and the uh, personality issues. But I'm telling you what, he came out pure gold and he's walking and he, he's fulfilling the purposes of God for his generation today. Very proud of him. But there's no... testimony without having done it. You cannot make a testimony of something you've never done. Information is not a testimony. It needs to be challenged. Those who take it seriously. Testimonies are those who take it seriously and no testimony comes without practice. So, for the church, I believe where the message, for the, the message of the Lord was really that here's, here's where we're going that we're, we're going to be moving and mothering and fathering a church to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. The atmosphere and the environment has to be such that you are fully equipped to deal with your issues and agendas. Agendas are easy. You simply die to it and let God resurrect it properly. Because if you have, keep your hands into your agenda, you will actually mess it up. You will try to make it happen your way in your time. The mothering is basically an atmosphere of love, acceptance, and forgiveness. And quite frankly, there's nothing that Jennifer and I hasn't seen or heard that we haven't seen quality results. Everything from every imaginable addiction and sexual sin, we've seen people totally transformed on a regular basis. And we're doing this uh, around the world, literally. 
It's basically a return to the simplicity that's in Jesus, but equipping people to teach people how to deal with their issues and their agendas is primary. That's mothering. But once they feel safe and secure, clean on the inside, then all of a sudden you, buy, you, you can basically then father them. You can pull the gold out of them. You can stick them up here with no pre-planning and say, go for it. How many people would be hesitant to just go for it? unless you felt so safe and secure in that environment. How about in a house group? How many of you would require to feel safe and secure in a house group before you opened up? Right? These principles remain throughout. Matter of fact, the best way to even get people unpacked is every house group has someone that would like to do all the talking. Because we have talkers and we have quiet people, right? I've seen house groups and churches destroyed because of that. The talkers got to learn to be still sometimes and listen. And you know who you need to listen to? Talkers? I'm a talker. I know who I'm talking about. <laughs> this is going like this. I could point out like this, but I got three more pointing at me. For me, it's a death with quiet people to sit and not fill the air with words a little longer than normal. But you know what happens? A miracle happens when you shut up a little bit longer than you feel is proper. <laughs> when this thing on the inside is going, mm, just wait a little bit longer and drop down your spirit. The quiet person talks and usually what they say is pure gold. See, the trouble with them is they, they do it up here. You do it right here. But we need both. And some talkers only talk in a meeting because they're insecure. They have a need to be seen and heard. If you can deal with the insecurity, they can be more comfortable and healthy. They can, they'll always be a talker. There's always extroverts and introverts. God's not going to change that. But he can make you a healthy introvert, healthy extrovert. But you deal with your issues, you die to your agendas. That partakes in a family. I heard this this morning that basically I don't have the youth pastor prophesying my titles, but we've got a worship team that's so far and, and prophetic voices that so far you've nailed it in the last few weeks, haven't you? They basically, if you've been here, they've, they've got my title. I don't say what I'm preaching ahead of time. They got, it's sons and daughters are rising up. Sons and daughters, you, you can't be a father unto sons until you've been a son unto a father. Jesus got acknowledged by God the Father when he said, This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. I know people have, people that are rugged individuals have a hard time with titles in general. I don't care if anybody sees me as their spiritual father or not. The point is, the principle is not going to be done away with it, whether you're comfortable or not. It's a principle. It's got to, you can have many fathers, many mothers. It's a principle. You go and get a school, a woman school teacher needs to father you. It's the question of, will you adjust internally? But the church, the church does need reparented. The church has learned far too much the mothering approach. And the gold has not been properly unpacked because of that. Here's the, here's the plan. I'm going to close with this. I believe that the church has got to create the atmosphere for mothering to deal with issues and agendas, but to equip the saints to impact the culture. That's the goal of fathering, to impact in wherever you go to work. It's not inside a building. This is a training ground. It's wherever you work, wherever you're at in life. It's to be a life message to impact the world around you. Without fathering, you won't. You'll wait for a church service to learn more stuff. God's basically saying, Oh, listen, I'm going to read this out of the message because sometimes you read a different translation and just nice Philippians 2, 19 to 21 in the message. I plan, according to Jesus' plan, to send Timothy to you very soon so he can bring back all the news 
of you that he can gather. Oh, how that will do my heart good. I have no one quite like Timothy. He is loyal and genuinely concerned for you. He didn't say he is loyal and genuinely concerned for me. He is loyal and genuinely concerned for you. He's others oriented. Most people around here are looking out for themselves with little concern for the things of Jesus. But you know yourselves that Timothy's the real thing. He's been a devoted son to me as together we've delivered the message. As soon as I see how things are going to fall out for me here, I plan to send him off. And then I'm hoping and praying to be right on his heels. To train up a child in the way he shall go. That's where it gets mastered. It needs to be mastered. That way he will not depart from it. Now listen to this. We're talking about mothering and fathering. You say, well, where are you coming up from these... Paul himself used both terms in 1 Thessalonians. This is the one to write down because then what I'm saying, you can read it for yourself. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 14. For you yourselves, this is a letter to the Thessalonians. He's saying, for you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God and entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is our witness, nor did we seek to glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. Here's one of the key verses. But we, this is the Apostle Paul and his team, but we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel, but also our very lives because you had become dear to us. That would make me feel safe and secure from the heart attitude regardless of what was preached. That's the mothering. Now, it goes on, For you remember, brethren, our labor and our toil, for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God and your witnesses. And God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. Verse 11, As you know, we were exhorted and comforted, charged and commissioned, charged and commissioned, every one of you as a father does, to his own children, that you would work, walk worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So basically, I'm giving you my very life to instill safety and security to where you feel like you've been mothered properly by Paul and his team. We showed you that we cared. We opened our heart to you. And we came with much affliction. We paid the price. It was the death of Jesus dying in us that life might be given to you. That's really what he's saying. That as I die to my flesh, resurrection life is being replaced through death, burial, and resurrection. It's being stored up in me, and it's life to you. It's how you respond to affliction. It's basically bringing it to the cross and allowing it to do something of value in your character, your divine nature. But we then exhorted, comforted, but then we charged and commissioned. You charge and commission someone, you send them to do, not just to be. You're commissioned to be and to do. Go, do something. Don't just listen. Don't just receive ministry. Give ministry. Commissioning, sent forth. He mothered and he fathered them, even in his own language. How much more does the church need that? Do you have a spiritual father in your house? Do you know who that is? I've had several. You can have more than one. 
As a baby Christian, the only person that connected with me was Watchman Nee, and he was dead. But his writings had more life on it. And he was the only one that talked my language. A broken man doesn't miss a move in another man's spirit. None of my pastor friends talk like that. But he talked in a language that I understood experientially. And then when my parachurch ministry was bigger than some people's churches, then I was taking notice of a Pentecostal man. And he would preach stuff that I would say as a baby Christian. I'd say, well, I feel like God's saying this. And then he'd go preach it. And the Lord showed me, don't do what he's doing. <laughs> and he showed me how not to start a church. <laughs> and then the one I consider my true spiritual father was when I was ready to start a church and God said, I'm not in it. You can keep your parachurch ministry. It was 200, 100 couples, 200 people, and it was larger than some of the churches, but God said, if you keep it, you can keep it, but that's all you'll ever have. You let it die. Let it die when it's at its peak and see if you can do that in your heart. And he says, you see that man over there? He's got a thousand-member church. He don't know you from Adam. You go serve that man. And don't tell him you're serving him. You just serve him from your heart. I carried block when he was building his building. I just did whatever I felt like the Lord was. And then out of 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 people, all of a sudden one day he picked five people. Dennis, these, this, I'm going to give you a practice preaching course. I feel like God's got something for you on your life. Never advertised, refused to promote myself and say, here I am, I'm God's man of the hour. Uh, notice me. Isn't that something how God will do that? But he taught me that until you serve somebody, until you're faithful in another person's ministry, don't expect to get your own, really. I know it's promoted that you should go take a two-year Bible course and then go start your ministry. And I think that is utterly nonsense because you've got peers raising peers. You've got children raising children, even if they're gifted children. I worked with gifted people from the time I got saved, far more gifted than me but they needed to deal with their issues and their agendas. So I believe what God is doing in this day is he's mobilizing. It's time to be doing something, mobilizing for life message application wherever you're at. In other words, it's all school. God's watching how you respond in school. All of life is school. And God's basically going to say, I'm going to be mobilizing I believe in 20, the end of this year, as well as the beginning of next year, is a mobilization. It's going to build momentum because people are going to be willing to work corporately and not, be, uh, not feel like they got to compete, compare, covet, <laughs> conceal, complain. And they're going to healthily get to the place where they don't mind being interdependent. That's family. And I heard it prophetically this morning to really establish it. God is equipping an army. He's growing a family, but he's preparing a bride. All of those are corporate. If we can't get corporate in our thinking, we're going to remain, we're going to remain atrophied, no matter how gifted you are. Because there's things that God's going to do. He says, basically, he says, I'm looking for people who will be part of a movement, a movement of God that is kingdom. And that's going to require a, uh, an ability to be corporate. As a matter of fact, it's a paradigm changer. We have to change the way church is being run. And the way to look at it, here's where I think we're at, even in the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides soul from spirit. That's like in you, Jesus says, that's flesh, that's spirit. Now choose. And hopefully you choose spirit over the flesh. Then he says, soul from spirit, joints and marrow. Joints and marrow. Joints are the body. Bone upon bone. Wherever there is a joint that is properly connected, the blood flows. Leviticus says life is in the blood. If you are improperly connected in the body, the bones dry up. Did you know that? If your bone is out of joint, it starts to dry up. It needs the marrow to come from the bone. 
How about Ezekiel's picture? The bones came together. Then there was sinew upon them. That is a progressive picture of an organic way that we grow corporately. First of all, bones got to come to bones. You got to find out where am I connected? Where am I in covenant? Seriously. That's, not, that's a minor thing nowadays because what that, what that has been used in the past, that's been used by tyrants and dictators in the past. But because something's been abused doesn't mean God's going to change the way He operates. He's still got one plan, plan A, the church. And sometimes He wouldn't do like Jesus, go, have I been with you so long? And you say, you know, that's why Jesus is going, oh, it's going to be so much better when I ascend and the Holy Spirit comes for these people. All right? They need, desperately need the Holy Spirit infusion. So, Father, right now we pray. And I want to pray a, a Father's blessing on everybody here. You can receive this if you want. You can ignore it if you want. You can do whatever you want. Those of you watching by Unstream. I prayed this one time in my first church and I asked for the people to come forward that basically never heard an affirming word through a male voice. And I opened my eyes and my dad was standing in front of me with tears pouring down his eyes. He had never heard an affirming word through a male voice. And I think that applies to sons and applies to daughters. But I want to pray for it right while you're in your seats right there. Father, in the name of Jesus. Yeah. I want us to soak in this because this is something that's caught, not just taught. This means if you want this, you need to receive it here. I'm just going to be a voice available. Just like John the Baptist said, I'm but a voice. We yield and we open up our heart. I want to pray for sons first. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Drink it in, men of God. Take it from God. It's not coming from just me. I'm just a male voice. I'm but a voice. But we are under the government of voice. Do you realize that? In the kingdom of God, you're under the government of voice. The voice of the Lord Jesus himself. The voice of the Word of God. We are under the government of voice. John the Baptist said, I'm but a voice crying in the wilderness. But that voice was infused with the purposes of God. And the purposes of God, by the power of the Spirit, is to bring many sons unto glory through Jesus Christ. I am but one. Teach me to be a son unto the Father that I might be a father unto sons. Thank you, Lord. This, daughters, daughters of Israel, daughters of the Most High King, hear ye him. This is my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. Drink deeply of the Father's approval, His acceptance, His love. I've seen people launched into healing ministries merely as a result of knowing that they stepped into a deep dimension of God's love for them and couldn't wait to release it to others. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Lord, just give me a word for Christina in Thailand and saying, you are a beloved daughter. You've got our DNA. I knew it even just watching Facebook. I felt the connection, blessing upon your heart and upon your life. Thank you. Got a daughter in Thailand. 
reproducing reproducers, ministering primarily to the ones that have come out of sex slave trafficking, revealing the heart of Jesus to them right now. Multiply it. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Thank you, Jesus. Sons and daughters are going to come into the place to where they will feel that what God has placed within me, the goal that he has within us individually, needs to be expressed to the world around us in the days ahead. We need to be a doer of that word, not just a hearer. We're a participator, not a spectator. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-Day Challenge, Self-Deliverance, Healing Rejection, Codependency, Intimate Prayer, The Functions of the Human Spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you can take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.